Good evening. Welcome out to Victory Baptist Church tonight. Um, appreciate you gathering around the computer on Facebook Live. And uh, we're going to open up in uh, a couple words of prayer, and then we'll have a song, and then we'll get to preaching and uh, see how the Lord can bless this evening. But this, before we get started, I want to remind everybody about the Amazed Fall Festival that we're going to have. It's going to be this Saturday, October 31st, from 4, to 4 until 7. And uh, make sure all the church family, make sure you bring your bags of candy that we can uh, help out Brother Ethan and Brother Chad and make sure we have all the candy for the kids that they can go home and uh, get, a, get a full belly of candy. Amen. And I also want to rem uh, remember our uh, fall revival starting next Sunday. Uh, it's going to be starting on 11, 11 a.m. Next, next Sunday from uh, November 1st. And uh, pray for Brother Sidney Weaver and Brother Cody Zorn as they come in and preach the word of God to us. That they'd be, uh, have what God wants for us. Amen. That we would get something that would revive our church, revive us individually. And uh, that we can go out to this world and, and, and share the gospel to a lost and dying nation. Also remember our pastor uh, with his throat, his throat. We get, did get to speak to him yesterday. Uh, he was doing quite well. Uh, he said he had overdone it last week a little bit, but just pray for him uh, that he would uh, continue to, to heal and progress to get better, that he can get back in the pulpit. Uh, he is a man of God, and we love him, and we hate to see him going through this, but uh, it's, it's, you know, I'm sure it's been well rested for him. Amen. And uh, it's good to see him out and about. All right, so let's just open up in prayer, and we'll have a song. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this, this evening. We just want to tell you we love you. And God, we're so thankful, Lord, for who you are. And God, we realize, God, within ourselves, there's nothing, Lord, good except for the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray this evening, uh, Lord, for these requests. I pray for the fall festival that's coming up. I pray for everybody that's going to come out. I pray for all the helpers here in the church. I pray for us to be uh, prayed up, Lord, that we would... Uh, have our desire to see, Lord, lost people come to know thee, Lord, in that fall festival. And, Lord, we pray for the upcoming revival, that you touch the men of God. I pray that you give them the messages that we stand in need of. And, God, that you would help us, Lord, to, to revive us again. God, that we would turn from our wicked ways, Lord, and turn unto you. And, God, I pray, Lord, for our pastor. God, I pray that you would continue to touch him and touch his throat. God, I pray that you just continue just to help him get better, Lord, as he progresses. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help him get ready, Lord, to get back into the pulpit. Lord, for our revival, God, I pray that you just help him. Once again, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in the service this evening. And bless the songs, Lord, the preaching. And God, whatever is done, Lord, we give you all the honor, praise, and glory out of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Lindsay is going to sing for us, and we'll get to the preaching.
Amen. If you enjoyed those songs, amen, put some of those thumbs and hearts out there on Facebook. That's a blessing. It's just a blessing, amen. Good to see when your kids are over there singing for the Lord. Six years old. Amen. Just want to do something. Amen. <laughs> just bear with me a second so I can get my composure. On the inside, boy, it's just bubbling over. It's just a blessing. Amen. Thankful for Lindsay. Amen. Being a role model to her. Turn over to John. John give his life to the ministry. This is a good example for my kids. I do love them this evening. Love the Lord. I said I pray that, that those songs were a blessing to you. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn it to the book of Ruth this evening. The book of Ruth short book but uh, it's got some great great scripture in it amen we're going to read out of chapter number one we're going to read uh, I have read the, to read the first 18 verses and uh, kind of give you what the Lord has for us uh, Ruth chapter number one we'll start with verse number one it says now and it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And there was a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, that went, that went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So we see here he had his whole family going down uh, into Moab. Verse number two, and it says, And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons was Malon and Chilion. You, you, uh, you refract the Bethlehem Judah, and they came into a country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was and she was left and her two sons. And they they took them wives of the women of Moab, and the name of one of them was Ophra, Orpha, and the other one was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her, of her son, two sons and her husband. Verse number 6, and it said, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from a country of Moab. For she had heard of the country of Moab, how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she had went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return into the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her daughters-in-law, Go, return unto your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grants you that ye may find, the, find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and lifted up, lifted up their voice, and wept. And she said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Will thou, why will ye go with me? Are ye yet any more sons in my womb that may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go to your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons. Would ye tarry for them? Would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay with them for having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother in law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister in law is gone back unto her people and to her gods. Return thou after thy sister in law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following the, after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, 
and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she had, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And so tonight, just as a way of an introduction or a little bit of a background here, I just want to kind of touch base on Elimelech and kind of focus really on the first five verses, and we'll kind of touch on the later half of the chapter as we get a little bit farther into the message. But I see here in the first chapter of the book of Ruth, uh, Elimelech and Naomi and her two sons were living Bethlehem, Judea, and they were sojourning to the land of Moab. Now, I, know, I noticed that the word sojourned means to temporarily stay there. Over there in the first part of the, the first verse, it says that they left the country of Bethlehem, Judah, because of a famine. And they were heading to Moab. Now, I started to look at the distances between uh, Bethlehem and Moab, and I was wondering, why did they leave? Why? Well, it told us that they had a famine. But why did they go to Moab? Moab was about 50 miles east of where um, Bethlehem was. And now, keep in mind that the word Bethlehem means house of bread. Bethlehem was where our Lord and Savior was born. Amen? Now, just to the north of Bethlehem is a little city called Jerusalem. Now, that city is only about five miles away. Now, that city has significance to us because our Lord and Savior died in that city of Jerusalem. So they were leaving the house of bread, amen, where you get born and get saved again, where you can meet the Lord Jesus. And they had to go through the blood to get to Moab. And let me tell you tonight, church, that if you're going to go from Bethlehem to Moab, you're going to have to trample the blood of Christ tonight because... But God does not want you to get down into Moab where it talks about that word Moab means who's your father. Now we know Moab, well, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, Moab was, uh, was brought to life because of uh, a couple of issues. We see Abraham was called out in the book of Genesis chapter number, I think it was 12, but he brought somebody along with him, Lot. And we know the story there where Lot ended up down in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they fled. They fled to a mountain of Zor. And there in that mountain, he had his two, his two daughters got him drunk. His two daughters laid with him, and there were two people that were born that night, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And it was all because of Romans 14, 7 that says, None of us liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. We see that this problem of Moab, Moab being a country within itself, they were going there because, man, if, if, if Abraham obeyed God and didn't bring Lot, where would Moab be in existence today? Think about that. Our decisions will have an effect on our generations to come. My decision today not to serve the Lord will have a direct effect on Bennett, will have a direct effect on Emory and the generations to come. Brother John preached this morning on possession of the land. God has already promised this to us and he's already prepared it for us. How come we can't do that? It's because of our decisions that we've made. It's because of our decisions of our parents that were made that we're struggling to get to the land that where we need to possess it. Remember, no man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. How much blood will be applied to my hands? How much blood will be applied to your hands when we get to heaven because of the things and decisions that we've made that's caused a negative impact on the, on the kingdom of Christ? As I see it, I see a family of four basically had two choices. Either they, had to, they could stay in Bethlehem and starve their bodies, or they can get to Moab and they can starve their faith. And we see that they chose to go into Moab. Husbands tonight, fathers tonight, there's a grave responsibility that falls upon our shoulders to make sure that we're listening to the Lord. Because it tells us down here in the lower part of the scripture that, that she even heard that the Lord had visited her people again, giving them bread. So it was probably like a four or five day journey from Bethlehem to Moab. And so that, that news was traveling to her. It means the Lord had already met with them. But yet, she had already lost a husband. She had lost two sons. And she was down there by herself. Today, 2020, seems like there's a great famine in the land. What are you going to do? Are you going to uproot your family? 
from the house of bread, from the church where you've been planted, from the church where you go tonight. You might, not, you might be watching this evening and you don't come to victory. You may go to another church. But this famine has gotten you to the point to where you think you can uproot and carry them somewhere else to get something that would sustain you until the famine is over. Is over. Let me challenge your heart tonight that you stay where you're at because it wouldn't be too much longer that the Lord would show back up again and start providing that bread that you need on your daily walk. We see here, so let me, let, let me give you your title, my title tonight. My title tonight is Where Will You Go From Here? All of a sudden, you're presented with an opportunity to uproot and to go somewhere where it looks better that you would be able to get something for your family. But where do you go? You're at a crossroads tonight. There'll be a lot of, a lot of people will change, have changed the way they worship in the current landscape of today. If COVID ever leaves, there'll be many of people that won't be sitting here on the pew because they've uprooted during the famine time and went to Moab. And I'm glad that God let, let Naomi come back from Moab into the house of bread, but there's some things that she had lost. Over there, in the, in the, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but over here in the, uh, verse number 19, it says that when she came into Bethlehem, uh, the city was moved about them, and she said, Is this Naomi? She came back into Bethlehem, and they didn't really recognize her. Why? Boy, because she had lost some things. Maybe she had her head hung low tonight. Maybe she was coming in. You could see her. She didn't have a husband that was leading her. She didn't have two sons that were helping, helping get her down the road. But she was just by herself with somebody from another country. But she came back. And I'm glad that God lets us come back. But you'll come back a little bit more empty-handed tonight. I want to challenge your heart. If you're here listening to the service online, ask yourself this question. Is it worth losing what I have in Bethlehem down in Moab? Is it worth it? And so I see here, the very first thing here, just kind of in the introduction, is the famine. In these, in these days, it tells us that the judges were ruling, and uh, the judges, they didn't do what was right in the sight of the Lord. And so if you don't keep uh, your people going in the right direction, they're going to do what is right in the sight of their own eyes. And it's just like kids. If I leave my two kids at the house, and they're just free to do what they want to, guess what? House don't get towed up. Uh, bedroom's going to be a disaster. Food wrappers going to be everywhere. They're doing right what's in their eyes. But mom and daddy comes in, got to be cleaned up. All the mess has got to be cleaned up. You still got to partake and fill in your belly and doing what you want to do, but there's certain things that have to happen. We do, when we get away from the Lord and we get out of Bethlehem, we start doing what we think is right. Typically in a famine, you'll find yourself doing things that you never thought you'd do. Do you see people running? We see Elimelech, they're running, they're leaving the country where they were. They're retreating, they're withdrawing themselves from the house of bread, from Bethlehem. And when the famine sets in, you'll see the first thing that you want to pull back from, and you want to run from, and you want to retreat from, is the house of God. I don't know what it is. I guess it's just this old flesh and Adamic nature that we don't want to come to the house of the Lord. We know that we'll get fed. We'll know it'll be great for our families. People will get saved here, get help here. But we will still want to retreat and run from the house of bread. And a lot of times when we get, down, get back to it, we refuse to go back. There have been times, if you be honest with yourself and you've gotten out of church, you're, you're sitting here. You, you ran. You've retreated. And you refuse. That's a dangerous place to be in tonight. So let me challenge your heart. In this, family, in this famine, where will you go from here? Will you run? Will you retreat? Will you refuse to go back? They left, they left Bethlehem in a, in a physical famine, but they went down to Moab into a spiritual famine. You went from one famine to the other. 
And I, I, let me grant you this tonight, church. The spiritual famine is far worse than the physical famine. This physical body can live on very few substances. Amen. Like you, all you need is bread and water. That's it. You just bread and water, you'll be fine. But spiritually, you got you gotta have you gotta have the word. You gotta have this kind of water. You got the Bible tells us that we're not gonna live by just bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And I'm glad that we have God's canon of scriptures here. Every word God has spoken to us. This is what we need to live by. But they get down in the famine and they they leave a spirit physical and they went down to a spiritual famine. The second thing I see, I see a failure. A failure to, it says here in verse 1, it says, went to sojourn into the country of Moab. Man, Elimelech didn't, didn't want to just spend forever down there, but just, just a little time. Preacher always, I've heard preachers say this many times, sin will keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you're willing to pay. He got down there in Moab. He probably thought he'd just spend maybe a year, maybe not even that long. But he died before he had the opportunity to get back. Could you imagine standing before the Lord, you left the house of bread, got down to Moab and died in the world, and you meet God in heaven, and what kind of, what kind of, what kind of conversation will that be? What kind of, I mean, like he lost his two sons and left his wife. As a man, it's my duty to make sure that my wife and my kids are in a position that they can sustain after I pass on. He was showing them that, you know what, it's okay to pull up and go somewhere else if you want to. It's okay to pull up from where God told you to be and where you're getting information from. It's okay to do that. You're just teaching bad habits. We teach our kids to be committed. Bennett plays football. Sometimes he don't want to go to practice. That old, it's being lazy. That's all it is. But we made a commitment to be there so you neglect everything else to make sure it's going to make that commitment happen. And as in church, you make a commitment to come to the house of God, to come back to preacher, to come worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, and yet we don't want to have that same type of commitment. I see a failure. But God, I'll, I'll, I'll worship you next Sunday. We had some tragedies here happen last week with a police officer on 85. He got killed. That could be me. I'll do it next Sunday, Lord, I promise. And next Sunday never comes. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go from here? Where are you going to go? These signs of failure show signs of it's unconcerned, unfaithfulness, and unengaged. It's easy to pull up shop and go somewhere else when you aren't concerned about what's going on here. When you're just not faithful to reading your Bible and praying and coming to church. And when you're not engaged when you're here. Church, if we want revival, we have revival scheduled next week starting on the 1st. And if we want revival, we're going to have to be engaged. We're going to have to be faithful. And we're going to have to be concerned. Because if we're not, you might as well just not even come. It's serious. This thing, this thing of serving God is serious. Amen? And I remember being back in high school and being, being in college and be like, man, you know what? I'll, just, I'll give it 110% when I get out of high school. Then college came. Why well, I do it when I get out of college? Now family came. Now it's a career. It just doesn't stop. And that's why it's important to train up a child in the ways they should go. To instill in them how you're supposed to do it. Because as they get older, things are going to, trials are going to come. Temptations are going to come. And we've got to know that this is where you come to get help. You don't pull up and go to Moab. You stay in Bethlehem until you get a word from the Lord to pull up and go somewhere. God will direct you, but God's never going to tell you to get up and go to a place that you they're not going to get fed from him. And I'm glad God knows, amen, the beginning from the end. I'm glad, I'm glad he knows the way that we take. 
I'm glad the Bible tells us that our, our, the, the, our steps of a, a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And I'm glad, the third thing I see here this evening, I see that there's a future. Naomi is down in Moab. Surely she thinks that she is just going to die here. But I, if we look in, chat, in, in verse number 6, I see in the future there's an opportunity. It says in verse number 6, it says, And there she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return to the country from the country of Moab. For she heard that the country of Moab, how the Lord had visited his people and given them bread. I'm glad there's an opportunity to return. Tonight you might be sitting at home thinking, there's no way I can go back to where I, where I need to be. There's no way I can go back to my, Beth, my Bethlehem. I'm down here in Moab. But God, God let her know that he was still providing in Bethlehem and that she needed to be there. Amen. The opportunity to return, not only to return, but to rekindle. We see in the latter half of verse number 6 that the Lord brought her to a place to make a decision to go back to that house of bread. I'm sure in her many years that she was down there that Naomi couldn't stop thinking about Bethlehem. For the last time that she had some bread from God. Amen. There might be some times in your life that it's dry. There might be some times in your life that you can't see God providing the bread. But let me tell you tonight, church, that God will still provide. He's still faithful. Amen. He will still break the bread in his house. Amen. He wants you to come and get it from him. I'm glad God gives us an opportunity to rekindle. No doubt she thought, how in the world did I get down here? How in the world am I still down here? I'm not, I don't have a husband. My kids are dead. I just don't know how long I can stay down here. But I'm glad that God said, you can come back. I'm glad God gave her that opportunity because he could have killed her too. Right? But God was using Naomi for somebody else. Bring a roof. And that's a whole other message. We can't get into all that tonight. But I'm just telling you tonight that God will, God will send some things in your life and some trials and some dry times that you might be able to help somebody else that's down in a place that they don't need to be at to bring them up out. Amen. And I'm glad I, uh, April 24th of 1994, amen, God sent by a preacher to show me that I don't need to be out in Moab, that I need to be up in Bethlehem. Amen. That about this spot over here that I call upon the name of the Lord that night. And I'm glad I could go to a time. And I'm glad I go to a place that God showed me tonight that I could get out of Moab and that I could get born again and get back to where I needed to be at. I'm glad God will give us a chance to get back, to return and to rekindle that love that we have for him. There's an obligation, I see, in verse number 7. It says, wherefore she went out forth of the place where she was. And to her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went away to return to the land of Judah. I love how the Bible here put it, she went forth out of the place where she was. It's not that she had to go somewhere else and get something. She left exactly where she was and started heading back to where she needed to be. And it's just like in Luke 15, how that prodigal son came into himself. He came into himself in the hog pit of this world. And he went back to where he needed to be. I'm glad tonight that if you're in a place of wickedness, it is your obligation to get back to God. God will send you the message that says, hey, you need to get back to me. You need to get back to where you needed to be at that house of bread. But it's your obligation, it's your duty to get back to the house. You talk, what are you talking about, preacher? If you look at Luke 15, the father didn't go after him. The father only went to him when he saw him on a great way off as the prodigal was drawing nigh unto the father. What did the father do after he saw him come down the road? He ran to him. I don't know how far that was, but it, it, over the scripture it says that he ran, he ran down the road and, and fell upon him and kissed him. I, tell, I, I remember who preached that message not too long ago here in the church. But in those days, it was custom for if a child left the house and brought reproach upon the father's name, that when he came back, the, the village would stone the, stone the son. The father left exactly where he was at and ran to him and said he fell on his neck. What is the neck? The neck's the most tender part. They can get your neck, you can die, you can be paralyzed. He fell on him and kissed him. But I'm glad the father, when you make your step, 
God will make the rest happen. Amen? I'm glad that even though she was in a place of wickedness, in order to get back, she had to get up, and she left where she was. If you're ever going to get back up and get to the place where you must be, you have to realize, you have to repent, you have to return, and you have to refocus. The very last one is the very important. You've got to refocus. Because if you don't refocus, this right here, I mean, the children of Israel wandered in the desert. Then they got to where they needed to be, and they, they said, oh, bless God, I wish I was back down in Egypt. I wish I was, I was, I wish I was a slave still. Why? Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people, which are called by now my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Tonight, I want to ask you a question. Are you in Bethlehem or are you in Moab? Are you going to be like Orpha and go back and serve her gods? Or are you going to be like Ruth and cleave and get to where you need to be? Where are you going to go from here? If we look at verse number 16, we see here that, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave, to leave thee, or return from the following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. For thy people shall be my people, and my God, and thy God, my God. We had somebody from a different country, Ruth. said, You know what? Your people are going to be my people. Naomi hadn't been there in I don't know how long. It's been 10 plus years. But Ruth had enough faith in God and faith in where they were going that the people that was going to accept her would accept her as well. Don't have, that, don't have that fear that if you come back to where you need to be, the people of God won't accept you back in. God showed me here that we need to make sure that if we're going to ask people and challenge people to get their heart right with him and for them to come back to the house of bread, we, as a Christian people, better be ready to welcome them back in. Not to shun them, not to be like, oh, I, you've been down there, I can't, I can't be friends with you, to accept them back in and fellowship with them just like they, like, just like they never left. It's not, it's, not, it's not on us. It's not on us to judge them, to say, you know what, you fail. Let God do the judging, and we do the accepting in. Where are you going to go from here? They left in a famine land. They left in a famine. Man, they had a failure. But I'm glad their future was brighter. Amen? They had the opportunity to rekindle. Amen? They had the opportunity to return. And that obligation was to get back close to, back to the Lord. And I want to challenge your heart tonight, church. You're watching where you're at. You can, you can, where you're at today, you can make a decision that, you know what, I'm going to take, I'm going to take where I'm at, I'm going to turn around, I'm going to go back to the house of bread. And you come and sing for us. Now, obviously, we can't have an invitation here in the church and nobody here. But you can be in your house right now, quiet and still. And you can ask the Lord to help. Lord, you know where I fell know exactly where I'm at. You know exactly what it took for me to realize that I'm not in the place I need to be. I'm down in Moab tonight, God, but I know I need to be back in Bethlehem. God, I'm trusting in you to take me back just as I am. You know what God said? He's going to do it. God said all we have to do is just confess our sin. He is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I'm glad no matter what we've done, you know how far we've gone, that God will take us and clean us up. I challenge your heart to read over there in the book of Luke 15 how the father treated the son when he came back. He didn't just accept him, he cleaned him up. The son was still dirty from the hot sin of this world. But yet he took him, he loved on him, got him, got him new clothes, got him shoes, just cleaned him up, killed the fatted calf for him. That's you tonight. That's you. Make a decision. Every time the word of God is preached in your life, you have a decision to make. 
Either you're going to accept what's preached or you're going to deny what's preached and you're going to keep doing what you're doing. I think John mentioned this morning, there's a deadline coming. And no matter what you do in your life, if you cross that deadline, there's no reason even to continue on. Because God's given you chance after chance after chance after chance. I'm glad God's long-suffering, but there comes a time to where the deadline comes. So I challenge your heart tonight if you're watching. Get your heart right with the Lord. He will accept you back with open arms.